All right, welcome everyone. It's good to see you. Thanks for being here, whether you're with us in person or you're joining us online. It's great to greet you. And as always, and I never get tired of saying this, I want to give a big shout out, a big what's up to all you folks who are joining us at our Church Anywhere location down in the old Southside neighborhood. Uh, we're not going not to invite you to turn any place particular in your Bible right now like I normally do because we're going to uh, put some uh, scripture up on the screen that we're all going to read together in just a few minutes. Uh, so I, I don't want you to think that I've forgotten that because that's something that we say every weekend. But I want to just welcome you. This is the second week of a very special message series called Spiritual Rhythms where we're talking about spiritual disciplines. And as I told you last week in the introduction, spiritual disciplines are spiritual practices that lead to spiritual transformation. In fact, that's so important. I'm going to put that on the screen and let's say it together. Let's read it together. I want to hear your voices. Here we go. Spiritual disciplines are spiritual practices that lead to spiritual transformation. And when we began last week, I told you that there are a variety of opinions among believers about how many spiritual disciplines there are. But rather than get caught up in, in any kind of an argument about how many there are, what I did was I gave you a five-point filter that you could use to, to determine what is and what is not a spiritual discipline. We'll put them up on the screen just as a reminder. Number one, spiritual disciplines are both personal and corporate. So they're things that we practice on our own in our individual Christian lives, and they're things we do together. And last week we used the example of prayer. That's a great example. We pray in our lives individually all the time. We come together uh, as a body of believers. We pray, and we pray with other brothers and sisters in different settings outside of church. Number two, spiritual disciplines are activities, not attitudes. So spiritual disciplines aren't thoughts. They're not feelings. They're activities. They're actions. They're things we do. And that's a critical thing that we have to understand about spiritual disciplines. Number three, spiritual disciplines are modeled in the Bible. And that's a great, great thing to remember when you're using this filter of how we identify what is and what is not a spiritual discipline. Here's another one that's great also. Spiritual disciplines are encouraged in the Bible. And finally, number five, spiritual disciplines are a means not an end. Spiritual disciplines are a means, not an end. And what that means is you don't become spiritually mature just because you practice spiritual disciplines. It's the practice of spiritual disciplines that make you spiritually mature. And that's a really important thing to understand about spiritual disciplines. And God's desire to see spiritual transformation happen in all of our lives. Remember, I told you last week, who were, the, who were the main critics and enemies of Jesus? They were the Pharisees. Now, in a sense, nobody ever practiced spiritual disciplines like the Pharisees did in terms of worship and rituals and, 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 and sacrifices and all those things, but their hearts were a long way from God. What they, what they were doing was just going through the motions that never changed them on the inside. And so this is why we have to remember that spiritual disciplines are a means not an end. Now, we're talking about spiritual disciplines for six weeks. We began last week with a little bit of an introduction, and then we talked about the spiritual discipline of submission. This weekend, we're talking about the spiritual discipline of confession. In the coming weeks, we're going to talk about meditation, we're going to talk about fasting, we're going to talk about rest, and we're going to talk about celebration. And you probably noticed, and I've even had some people ask me about this, you probably notice uh, that we're not going to be talking about some of the most basic spiritual disciplines like prayer or like reading the Bible. And we're not going to do that primarily because those are spiritual disciplines that most believers already understand and are at least on some level practicing in their lives. And so I decided we would spend some time talking about the lesser known spiritual disciplines because they have great power for spiritual transformation in our lives. And we began with submission and we're going to talk this weekend about confession. And here's what I want to tell you, friends, right from the beginning. I want to tell you that I believe this message on confession is so important, not because it's a great message that I have written, but because the message and the power of confession is so important in our lives that before we go any further, I want us to actually bow and pray together. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, we always make the public reading of Scripture a part of our weekend service because we have such respect for God's Word, we stand for it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you right now, if you're able, to go ahead and stand for the reading of uh, the Scripture. I'm going to put one single verse of Scripture on the screen that we're all going to read together. And then if you're able, I want you just to remain standing, and we're going to pray together for just a moment, okay? So here we go, First John chapter 1 and verse 9. Let's read it together. Let me hear your, voice, your voices. If we confess 
our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. All right, we always ask God to bless the reading uh, and the hearing of his word. Would you bow with me and let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you so much and we are so deeply grateful for your love for us. And we are so deeply grateful for the depth of your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. And as long as we live in this sinful fallen world, clothed with these sinful fallen bodies, we're going to struggle with the reality of sin. And so I pray that you would help us to recognize not just the power of confession, but the absolute necessity of confession in our lives so that we can, we can please you by being obedient to you and grow in our faith to the maturity that you want to see in all of our lives. And so I pray you just open up our hearts for these next several moments and that your spirit, who Jesus called the spirit of truth because he reveals truth, would speak to all of our hearts. And I ask that in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed and said, amen. amen. All right, thanks. You can be seated. A couple of Friday nights ago, Sandy and I had our granddaughter Grace spend the night, uh, which is a common occurrence on Friday nights. One of our grandkids will usually spend the night, uh, and uh, we love that. Actually, I love it anytime our grandkids are in the house. I just love having them around. And on this particular uh, Friday night, Sandy turned on the television, went to Disney Plus, and found the old movie Pollyanna. Anybody ever seen the old Disney movie Pollyanna? Probably several of you have seen it, but I wouldn't be surprised if several of you have not because it's an older movie. I think it was released in 1960. You might recognize uh, the name Pollyanna. You might know a little bit about it, but if you've never seen it, I would encourage you to take the time to do it. Well, uh, the movie Pollyanna is a movie that tells the story of a 12-year-old orphan daughter of missionaries who was sent to live with her wealthy but strict aunt in a small town in Vermont. But here's the thing about Pollyanna. She's not an ordinary 12-year-old girl. Uh, she is very cheerful. She's very talkative. She's very optimistic. She always looks for the good in others and for the good in life. She always wants to find something to be happy and glad about. It seems that she and her father, before his death, had actually created a, a little game between the two of them that they called the glad game. And it was a game where they looked for the good. Well, in one particular scene, she is having a conversation with the Reverend Ford, who is one of the main characters in the movie. And Reverend Ford is basically one of your typical fire and brimstone preachers who knows a whole lot more about what he's against than what he's for. You ever known a preacher like that? I'm thankful you didn't say my name. <laughs> He's practicing his sermon, and in this scene, Pollyanna asks him, would you like to practice your sermon on me? And she goes on to say that that's something that she used to do for her father. But he's not paying much attention to her. And then at one point, she asks him, do you like being a minister? She said she asked her father that question once, and he said he was glad he was a minister, but then he went on to say, but sometimes it made him sad because he couldn't seem to get through to his congregation. Well, that captured the attention of Reverend Ford, and he said, I suppose every minister of God faces that same problem. And then he asked her, did your father ever solve the problem? And Pollyanna tells him that her father read something one day. It was actually a quote from Abraham Lincoln that helped him. And the quote went like this, When you look for the bad in mankind expecting to find it, you surely will. And she said that quote caused her father to start, to start looking for the good in people. And that's when together they, she and her father, started searching the Bible, she said, for happy texts and what her father called glad passages. One's like shout for joy or be glad in the Lord. And then Pollyanna tells Reverend Ford, there are 800 happy texts in the Bible. Did you know that? She went on to say, my father said, if God went to the trouble to tell us to be glad and rejoice 800 times, he must have wanted us to do it. And that little conversation ends up having a powerful impact on Reverend Ford. And it changes the way he preaches. And Pollyanna is a sweet movie. And I would encourage everyone to watch it because it has a wonderful message. But while I genuinely love and appreciate 
the message of Pollyanna, and while I am so grateful for the many happy texts and glad passages in the Bible, I feel really compelled to tell you this weekend that no one can ever experience the real depth of joy that God has for them until they deal with the reality of the sin in their life. Because sin separates us from God, and sin has the power to destroy our lives. And while I believe there are glad passages and happy texts in the Bible that talk about the forgiveness of sin, each one of them has to be understood in the context of the danger of sin, which is something that people don't talk much about today. In Cornelius Cornelius Plantiga's book, Not the Way We're Supposed to Be, he writes these words. The awareness of sin used to be our shadow. Christians hated sin, feared it, fled from it, grieved over it. But that's not the way it is today. I read an interesting article this last weekend from Relevant, or this last week rather, from Relevant Magazine that was called, Why Doesn't Anybody Talk About Sin? The author was a man who is a biblical studies professor at North Park University in Chicago, and he talked about his experience of teaching a class every semester called Jesus of Nazareth. And he said at the end of each class, I found this so interesting, at the end of each class, he has the students, each class, he has the students recite the, recite the Lord's Prayer together. And he says he does it for two basic reasons. First, because he believes the Lord's Prayer sums up the entire teaching ministry of Jesus. And second, he does it because the word sin is found in the Lord's Prayer. And he goes on to write, though Matthew's version, and that's the version that most of us are familiar with because it's a lengthier version. It comes in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. He said, though Matthew's version normally uses the words transgression or trespasses in talking about sin, Luke's version, a much shorter version in Luke chapter 11, it's verses 1 through 4, uses the word sins. And he says, I ask my students to import that word sins into Matthew's version because I feel they need to hear the word sin over and over again. And then he shared about a time when a student approached him and told him she was offended that he would import the word sins into the Lord's prayer because it was so negative and so harmful. And the professor urged her to take a good long look at the Lord's prayer there in Luke chapter 11 and think about what she was saying because, and this is a direct quote from the article, a direct quote from the professor. He said, saying that each of us sins isn't harmful, it's true. And not only that, it tells the story of who we are. I mean, think about that for a moment. He said, saying that each of us sins isn't harmful, it's true. And then he went on to say, and not only that, it tells the story of who we are. Let's pause and talk about that for a moment. Whenever I share the gospel with someone, and just in case you aren't familiar with what I mean by that, whenever I talk to somebody about what they need to know and what they need to do in order to make sure their life is right with God, I always begin by talking about the reality of sin, always. In fact, more years ago than I can remember, I came up with this little outline that I would use to share the gospel with somebody, and it was just a three-point outline that began with separation and then moved to substitution and finished with salvation. And the separation element of the outline is all about the reality of sin because, as I said earlier, sin separates us from God. In fact, the Bible comes right out and talks about the reality that we're sinners in a way that is impossible to miss. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, I'm sure you're familiar with the verse. Many of you, Paul says, literally, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I talked a little bit about that last week when we talked about the record book of sin illustration. If you hear, you remember that I talked about the truth that if we could imagine for a moment that my left hand re- represented my life, this is me, and my Bible is not a Bible, but a record book of every sin I ever committed. And if you put that record book of sin on my life, you don't even see me anymore. I'm completely covered up by the reality of my sin. But even though the Bible is really clear about this reality that we're all sinners, there have been several times over the last 40 plus years when I've been launching into this explanation of what someone needs to know and do in order to be right with God, and I talk about the separation from sin, and someone will stop me, and they'll begin to tell me stories about all the good things they've done in their life because they try hard to live a good life. 
And I don't doubt for a second the truthfulness or the, ins- the sincerity of what they're saying to me. But that doesn't mean they're not a sinner. We all are. I try to be a good person. Would you say that about yourself? That you, for the most part, try to be a good person? I, I would hope that you would at least say that about yourself. I try to be a good person. If I visit your neighborhood, I'll never park my car behind your driveway. <laughs> Something that just irritates the fire out of me. And if we're on a plane together and you're in the seat in front of me and I need to stand up, I will never grab the back of your seat and use it as a brace to get up. Something that irritates the fire out of me. And if I'm in a car in front of you and the light turns green, you will never have to honk your horn at me because I'm not paying attention to the light. Something that irritates the fire out of me. Not somebody honking their horn, but somebody not paying attention to the light. I could go on, but I'll stop right there. None of those things or anything else that I could ever mention about trying to live a good life or good things that I try to do will ever change the fact on their own that I'm a sinner. You can create your own list and you can even be more serious about your list than I have been about mine, but the same would be true for you. Regardless of how good we are or how many good things we do, the reality remains that we're sinners and sin separates us from God. Sin separates us from God because the Bible says that God is absolutely holy and perfect and righteous and a holy God can't live in fellowship with a sinful man. In fact, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 says this, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And that light represents the holiness and the purity and the righteousness and the blamelessness of God. This is the truth about God. And so sin separates us from God because he is holy And that will never change for you or for me or for anyone until we come to a place where we admit we are sinners because that's the place that leads us to being able to understand that we can receive the forgiveness of our sin. And that takes us to point two in the outline, separation, and then we get the substitution, which is all about the truth that when Jesus died on the cross, he died in your place and mine. He died a substitutionary death. He died in our place to pay the penalty of our sin. I have this verse in my notes that Matt used for the communion meditation This week in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13 where Paul says, But now in Christ you who once were far away, far away, have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Far away. Why? Why far away? Because of the reality of our our sin in relation to a holy God. I'm sure many of you like me have seen many times this visible illustration of, of, of two cliffs and a chasm between and man's on one side and God's on the other side and there's... No way to get from where we are to where he is until you allow the cross to be a bridge between God and man. That's the good news of substitution. And then you get to the third point in my little gospel outline, and we talk about salvation, which is just how we receive the forgiveness of our sin and how we receive the promise of eternal life. But it all begins by necessity. It all begins with the reality that we are sinners and our sin separates us from God. But that's not the only thing I said about sin just a moment ago. I, sin, I said sin separates us from God, but I also said that sin has the power to destroy our lives. And it has the power to destroy our lives by damaging our relationship with God. Because here's a fundamental truth. Once you receive the forgiveness of your sin through salvation, you're still going to struggle at least on some level with the reality of temptation and sin. And it's the spiritual discipline of confession that can help you with that. Have you ever prayed and used the word acts as an acrostic? That's something that's been around forever. We'll put it up on the screen. The word acts, that's a big word in the New Testament because the book of Acts is like the history book of the New Testament. And, and each, because as you use it as an acrostic, each letter stands, stands for a different word that, that you incorporate into your prayers. Adoration, we tell God how much we love him. Confession, thanksgiving, we're thankful to that God blesses our lives the way he does. And supplication, which just is a word that describes what happens when we tell God what we need. Pay attention, take note of that word confession because confession is a spiritual discipline that leads to spiritual transformation. And that's something that we all need to acknowledge because as long, again, as I said earlier, as long as we live in a sinful, fallen world, we're gonna deal with the reality of temptation And sin, I have been a Christian for over 50 years in my life, and I deal with the reality of temptation and sin in my life every single day. I think any honest Christian 
would say the same. And it's the practice of spiritual disciplines. And in this context, the spiritual discipline of confession that helps us with this battle. Because remember, spiritual disciplines are spiritual practices that lead to spiritual transformation. In his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, John Ortberg has a chapter called Life Beyond Regret, and the tagline for that chapter is the practice of confession. The life beyond regret, and the pra- because it's all about the practice of confession. And what he does in that chapter is he addresses one of the most common questions that Christians ask in trying to understand, really genuinely understand, confession. And the question is, if I'm a Christian, and God has already forgiven me for my sins... Why should I have to confess them? Let me read you his answer. It's not long. Confession is not primarily something God has us do because he needs it. God is not clutching tightly to his mercy as if we have to pry it from his fingers like a child's last cookie. We need to confess, note this, in order to heal and be changed. Heal and be changed And then he goes on to say, when we practice confession well, two things happen. The first is we are liberated from guilt. The second is we will be a little less likely to sin in the same way in the future if we had not confessed. And he concludes by saying, sin will look and feel less attractive. So we confess our sins to heal and be changed. Confession is a spiritual discipline, and spiritual disciplines are spiritual practices that lead to spiritual transformation. But there's another reason why we confess our sins. While we receive what we could call judicial or positional forgiveness when we are saved, and what that is 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 what happens when you put your faith and trust in Christ and now God, instead of seeing you, to go back to my illustration, as a life completely covered by the reality of sin, he sees you covered by Christ who is blameless and holy. While we receive this judicial or positional forgiveness at salvation, we need to make sure that as we live our daily lives, our relationship with God isn't hindered by ongoing sin. Think about the relationship between fathers and their children. A good father is never, ever going to stop loving his children. If you're a dad here this weekend and I ask you the question, is there anything your children can do that ever cause you to stop loving them? I'm sure you would say no, absolutely not. I'm a dad. That's my answer. And if I said, would you ever turn your back on your children? I, I don't think anybody would say yes. I'm a dad. That would be my answer. No way. I would never, ever do that. But at the same time, there can and probably will be times in our relationship with our children when the relationship is disrupted because of the behavior of our children or maybe the behavior of the dad. And that disruption will be there until things are made right. And it can be the same way from a practical perspective. It can be the exact same way in our personal relationship with God the Father. Our relationship with God can be disrupted because of our behavior, our sinful behavior that we don't confess and we don't make right. And so the necessary question for all of us is how do we do that? Or how do we practice the discipline, the spiritual discipline of confession? I've got three things that I want to share with you, and I'm not going to be long with any of them, and I would encourage you to write these down. The first way that we practice the spiritual discipline of confession, and just like last week, I'm trying to be as practical as possible. I don't want to just spiritualize this. I want to give it some, some, some meat on a practical level. So write this down. We practice the spiritual discipline of confession when we ask for God's help. And here's what I mean by that. I want you to look at these words on the screen from David in Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24. I love this prayer from David. I love the honesty and the the raw uh, uh, 
reality in this, these words. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a bold prayer, wouldn't you say? Search me, know me, test me. See if there's any offensive way in me. And then lead me in the way everlasting. We practice the spiritual discipline of confession when we ask God for help. Because there are two dangers that can be associated with confession. And the first danger is ignoring our sin. And as unbelievable as it seems to me at times, there are a lot of people who have the ability to do this. I'll be honest and tell you, and I don't say this as a spiritual badge of courage because it's far from that. I've never had a problem recognizing the reality of my sin. Maybe that's the way I was raised because I was raised in, a, in an environment, in a church setting that, you know, there was a lot of conversation about sin. You know, Reverend Ford, I talked about him earlier in the movie Pollyanna, who knew more about what he was against than what he was for. I think I had a preacher like that when I was young. It's a very real thing for people. I've talked to people in personal conversations who are, are, are really, really walking down the wrong road and they just can't seem to, to recognize or see or grasp the reality of their sin. That's the first danger. The second danger of confession is the danger of self-condemnation where we just, we, we never let ourselves off the hook. We're on the mat and somebody's got their foot on our neck and they're holding us down and, and it's that sin. It's got its foot on our neck and holding us down and we just, we just think the only thing we can do is just beat ourselves up over and over and over again. But that is not the will of God for any of us. And so the best thing that we can do to avoid those two mistakes, those two dangers, is we ask God for our help in the same way David did. I hope you wrote down that scripture reference. That's a familiar passage of scripture, but I hope you wrote down the reference so you can know how to find it later. David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We ask God for help. That's number one. Number two, we choose complete honesty. This is the second way that we practice the spiritual discipline of confession. We choose complete honesty. I'm going to put the words that we read together earlier back up on the screen. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's a great verse of scripture. You got to make sure that you remember that reference too so you can find it again. But the really powerful part of that verse, in a sense, is that word confess. In the original language of the New Testament, that is the Greek word homologeo, and literally translated, it means to agree with or to say the same thing. That's what that word confess means, to agree with or say the same thing. You could also mean, say that it means to concede. It means uh, to, uh, not to deny. This is the reality of this word. And so you could literally read 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 like this. If we say the same thing as God or if we agree with God about our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so here's what we have to understand about confession as a spiritual discipline. And you ought to write this down somewhere. Maybe you ought to write it down in the margin of your Bible next to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Confession is spoken repentance. Confession is spoken repentance. If you're like me, when I was a little boy and I grew up going to Sunday school, I was taught that to confess means if I'm walking down the road this way, I'm going to stop and I'm going to turn around and I'm going to walk the other way. That's repentance. And confession is, in a very real way, is spoken repentance. You remember the parable of the prodigal son? That may be right in the top two or three most well-known parables in the Bible, Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 24. A uh, man had two sons, and the younger man demanded his inheritance, and unbelievably, the father granted his wish, and he went off to a far country, and the Bible says, depending on what translation you read from, he, he blew it all on, on wild, lustful living until he had nothing, remember? He didn't have a place to live and stay. He didn't have anything to eat. He took a job feeding pigs, which would have been so disgusting for a Jewish boy. And he longed to fill his stomach, the Bible says, with the pods that the pig ate. And so he came 
to the conclusion that he would just go back home and ask his father just to give him a job as a hired hand. At least he'd have a place to live and food to eat. And the story tells us, the parable tells us that on the way home, the son was thinking about what he would say to his father. And so Luke chapter 15 and verse 18, this is what he was saying. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now that's confession. That's confession. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, against God and against you. And as a result of my actions, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's confession. And here's why it's important for us to to understand that. Because confession is not just saying I'm sorry. And confession is not just I apologize. It is the honest recognition of our sin and the need The understanding of the need to call that sin exactly what God calls it because we see it through the eyes of God. That's confession. It's not, I'm sorry, I apologize, I regret, I'm sorry you were offended, or anything like that. It is much more honest. And we need to understand that because, and I mentioned this earlier, it is so easy for some to rationalize or defend or excuse their sin to the point where they don't even recognize it in their life because all of us, can we agree that all of us have at least some capacity in our lives for self-deception and that we have an enemy that preys on that capacity when it comes to our relationship with God? Here's the third thing we understand about confession. We practice the spiritual discipline of confession when we accept, everyone say accept, accept God's grace, which is God's favor that we don't deserve and that we could never, ever earn. We go back to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. And again, John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What a powerful verse that is. And it's a promise. And here's the thing about God. He keeps his promises. In fact, the Bible says that it's impossible for God to lie. So he's not going to tell us that if we confess our sins, he'll forgive us our sins and purify us for all unrighteousness if he's not going to do that. I've known a lot of Christians, and maybe this describes you today, who've had a hard time accepting the grace of God through forgiveness because they can't find a way to forgive themselves. I, I guarantee you there are people in this service right now who live out the reality of those words in their life every day. And there'll be people in every other service this weekend who are the same. But you can trust God's forgiveness. You can accept his grace and trust his forgiveness. I love these words from Lamentations Chapter 3, verses 22 through 23, which is, the book of Lamentations was written at the time when, the, when Israel, God's people, were at the lowest point in their life, and it was, a lamentation is exactly what it sounds like. But, in the, but, but there, are, there are different little pockets throughout the book that are just so gracious and so merciful and so good, and this is one of them. And the writer says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. And then he says, great is your faithfulness. What a great passage of Scripture that is. Because basically, uh, first of all, uh, the writer of the book of Lamentations says that God's love never ceases. And then he says his mercies never come to an end. And those are more than just words. Those are things that we need to think about. His love never ceases and his mercies never come to an end. And we need to stop and think about that because we make the mistake sometimes of thinking about God's love and God's mercy in the same sense that we experience or we give love and mercy. And with you and me, if you're like me, when it comes to giving love and giving mercy, I got a point where I say enough. I'm not going to let you do that to me again. Draw a line in the sand. I'm done. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? But that's not the way God is. His love never ceases and his mercy never comes to an end. And listen to me, friends. If those two things weren't good enough, then he goes on to say they are new 
every morning. And that is more than just an expression. You see that word new right there? It's a very specific word in the original language of the, Hebrew, of the Old Testament, the Hebrew language, it's the Hebrew word hased. This is the way it's written. This is, oh, we don't have to, I don't have the translation up there, but it's pronounced hased. And this is what it means, brand new or fresh. There are multiple words in the Hebrew language that can be translated new. This is a very specific one. And so when it says that, that the mercies of the Lord never, uh, the love of God never ceases and his mercies never come to an end, they are new every morning, that means there's a brand new way he expresses that in your life and mine every single day. Every day. And the truth is, most of us We'll never recognize those things because God is this infinite sovereign God who works in, so, in, in, in such wondrous ways that we don't always comprehend it. But there's a new expression of his love and a new expression of his mercy that comes into our life every single day because he's an unlimited God. And if you're someone this weekend who just for whatever reason really has a hard time forgiving yourself for something you've done, then I want you to, I want you to wrap your heart around that truth. And I'm sure that describes all of us at least at some level because it's something that can be a battle for me. How many times do we find ourselves in circumstances where our enemy, the devil, begins to whisper in our ear, reminding us of all the stupid, foolish, sinful things we've done, or we've thought, or we've participated in in the past, and we grimace and groan at every remembrance, but we can accept and we can trust the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. I don't know if you ever saw the old movie... The Mission, I think it was a movie that came out in the 1980s. The most familiar actor in the movie was Robert De Niro. It's a story that's set in the 1750s in the country of Argentina when a Jesuit priest goes there for the purpose of building a mission to try to convert the local natives to Christianity. The local natives are the Guarini people. And Robert De Niro plays the character Mendoza, who is a mercenary and a slave trader, and he is an evil man in so many different ways. In fact, he's so evil, he's so vile, he's so selfish, he's so brutal that it seems like there's no hope for him. But at some point in the movie, he comes to a place of repentance through the overall message of Christianity that's coming through the Jesuit priest and the things that are happening. But the strangest thing happens, as an act of penance, he's required to carry a heavy burden tied to his body everywhere he goes. And so there's a thick rope that's attached around his neck, and it, it's not a long, long, but it's not short. And at the end of the rope is like a big bag that carries around his sword and his armor and all the things of his life that represent how evil and brutal he really was. But through the ordeal of lugging that around, if you can imagine it, he begins to see his life differently. And he discovers that everything he's built his life on has really been a burden, not just to those around him, but to him as well. And he begins to see his own helplessness and his need for redemption, his need for God. One day, on a desperate climb up a mountain, Mendoza realizes because of this burden that he's carrying, he's not going to make it. But not only that, he realizes that he and this burden are threatening the lives of those climbing with him. And everyone else around him recognizes it well. And suddenly, in that scene, one of those Guarini tribe members, the very people that he would capture and, sl and sell as slaves, pulled out a knife and came around behind him. Now, Mendoza, De Niro's character, thinks that he's going to kill him, but the, the native stands behind him with his arm around his shoulders and raises his knife not to kill him but to slash the rope and release the burden. And now he's free. The burden is gone because the burden has done its work and Mendoza falls to the ground and puts his face in his hands and begins to weep uncontrollably because the burden that he's been dragging behind him is gone. What kind of burden are you dragging behind you this weekend? What level of guilt or regret 
or shame weighs down every single step you take. What have you done? What have you failed to do? What is it that you can't forgive yourself for? Confess it to God. Receive his forgiveness, his love, and his grace, and his mercy right now. Because here's something I can promise you. If you continue to carry it, if you continue to hide it, if you continue to call it something other than what it really is, you're going to drag it around you for the rest of your life. And that's not what God wants for any of us. When you came in, you should have received a little card that has the scripture verse that we've looked at. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And I'm going to encourage you, if you're brave enough or bold enough or open enough, you don't, certainly don't have to do this, but I'm going to encourage you to take one of the pens in the seat back in front of you or from your pocket or your purse and just write down whatever it is, whether it's one thing or many things. And Austin and Heidi are going to come and they're going to share a very special song that I requested to close this portion of our service. And I'm going to encourage you to stand. And as they sing that song, I'm going to encourage you to walk down front, tear it into tiny pieces, and drop it into one of these black totes as just a way of saying, I'm letting this go. I'm not going to carry this burden around with me any longer. Thank you, God, for your love and your mercy and your grace. I've already got mine filled out for all the services this weekend. I would encourage you to do the same. I'm going to pray, and then we'll, we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, Austin and Heidi come, and they'll lead us into the next part of our service. Father in heaven, we love you, and we're so grateful to you for your, your, your kindness, your grace, your mercy. We're so grateful that your love never ceases and your mercy never ends and that there is a new manifestation of those in our lives or you want to share a new manifestation of those in our lives every single day. Give us the courage in this moment to do maybe something that we have never been able to do before and that's let go of the burden and accept the wonder of your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.